Hi, I'm Rob Cos and welcome to my shop. We're going to take a deep dive into building a chest of drawers, focusing on the casework. Something when I was looking for information, couldn't find a lot on. Now that I've done a lot of them myself, I'm going to share with you what I know. Stay with us. I'm Rob Cosman and welcome to my shop. We make it our job to help you take your woodworking to the next level. If you're new to our channel, be sure to subscribe, turn on that notification bell, and don't forget to turn on the notification on your mobile device so you'll know every time we release a new video. Good? All right, back to the bench. So here's some samples of chests of drawers that I've built. This first one is actually a, a, a manufactured piece. I'm going to use it as an example of what not to do. The rest of these are pieces that I still have kicking around my house. This represents casework from 35 years ago up until fairly recent. I'm going to focus on the case, as I mentioned, because if it isn't square, it's very difficult to make a good drawer, meaning to get that perfect fit. The sides have to be parallel to one another. The top and bottom must be parallel. And if you think about it, it's just a box designed to fit other boxes. But there's some things that if you don't pay attention to, will turn out to be a disaster. And more importantly, you want it to last. One of the downfalls of this is 10 years of use in a regular home and it's going to be pieces. Whereas these, some of them have been in our home for over 35 years and they still work fine. A few knocks on the outside, but that's usually something you can repair. So I want to start, I'm going to go through the different materials. I'm going to talk a lot about the construction methods and hopefully by watching this, you're going to find some of the information that you're going to need in order to build those perfect piston fit drawers. Let's go over the various materials. Now remember, we're just talking about the case. So in this example of a um, manufactured piece out of a factory somewhere, it's made mostly out of particle board. This has a, uh, an oak skin on there or a veneer. This top is actually a plastic laminate on top of particle board. Not a good choice. This piece, I made the plywood myself. So it's what we would call an MDF core. So MDF, which if you don't know, is a man-made product. It's a wood fiber that is pressed together. I like it because it's stable. It's heavy. It's relatively strong. The downside is it has absolutely no resistance to moisture. So you have to be careful where you use it. What I did with this piece is I glued on a piece of solid ash onto the front edge and the back edge before I then sandwiched that MDF between two sheets of uh, fiddleback ash plywood. So if you do the one veneer. side, you need veneer, sorry. If you do the one side, you need to do the other. So that's done on both sides. This is a piece I made back when we didn't have any money, needed furniture for my kids. This was all made out of MDF, drawer fronts, sides back, the whole bit, and it's simply painted white. And surprisingly enough, it has held up over all those years. It's got a few marks in it, but it still works and works well. Here's an, this is a piece of store-bought plywood, again, but it is MDF core. And on this one, I added the solid wood lippings to the outside. So you can see your joint line right here and back here. Nothing wrong with that. Good product. This is solid walnut. Um, completely different construction methods. This is solid poplar. This is walnut. This is another piece of um, MDF core plywood that I made myself, cherry veneer on the inside and on the out, and solid wood lippings on front and back. We'll, we'll go through and talk about why I like this. Um, it's actually my material of choice. The nice thing about MDF is it doesn't have any inter internal voids. If you buy lumber core plywood, which is typically thin sheets of wood that are glued together in cross grain direction, you have the nice material on the outside, but oftentimes there'll be uh, knot holes all kinds of voids in there and sometimes they're really close to the surface. Don't like it. If you were to measure veneer core plywood with a pair of um, calipers or anything precise, you'll notice that it'll vary quite a bit along its edge. That becomes a real problem area when it comes to fitting into a dado. Dado's gonna, dado, which is a housing or a groove cut across the grain that you would fit a horizontal divider into, if it's not, the piece you're fitting in is not the same, you're going to have a gap or a tight spot somewhere. MDF core, MDF is far more uniform in thickness, and since you only have the two pieces of veneer top and bottom, the chances are it's going to be far better. And of course, solid wood, uh, you can fit that to yourself, so 
you don't really deal with the same issues. But as I mentioned, there are specific challenges working with solid wood. All right, now let's talk a little more about the actual construction. Okay, I want to talk about the dividers. The, I'm referring to these horizontal dividers. They uh, not only give strength to the case, but they're what the drawers, typically they're what the drawers actually ride on. Now, if you look, look at this one, remember, this is somebody else's. There are no horizontal dividers. And the reason why these cabinets are so weak is all you have are the sides somehow fastened to the top fastened to the bottom and it's really the back that gives it its strength and prevents it from racking extremely bad. Now you'll notice in this piece they've added a, a little thin metal piece to help keep the sides from spreading. Problem is that this will not stand any abuse whatsoever and uh, somebody leans on it really hard it's gonna it's gonna crush. Over here take these drawers out. This divider is made out of MDF it has a solid wood, in this case, ash lipping. And because the sides are MDF, the expansion, if there is any, is going to be the same. So these can be glued directly into here. That's sitting in a groove or a dado that is probably somewhere around an eighth to three sixteenths of an inch thick. I've tested MDF to MDF gluing and the material will, just, will come apart before the glue joint actually fails. So with that many, that many dividers, and that much glue surface, the only way this is gonna come apart is gonna be catastrophic failure of the entire product itself, not the glue joint. This is another example of using MDF. So nicest thing about this is you don't have to worry about movement. Everything is going to move in, in harmony. The downside is it's really heavy. Car moving this thing around is a ton, uh, just a huge pain. Now, this one, you'll notice that you don't see the dividers. By the way, this was made for one of my kids who has a fascination with pistols. Um, the, the drawer front itself, it comes down lower. It's flush at the top with the sides, but it sits below, and that enables it to hide the frame that's inside. So this is a plywood um, carcass, which means there's not going to be any appreciable movement across its width. So the frame is made up out of four pieces of poplar. There, uh, there's a nice strong joint here. This piece is purposely, sitting, purposely a little thinner than this piece so that when the drawer slides, it only runs on this. It doesn't interfere with this. There's a thin piece of eighth inch plywood to act as a dust panel so that you don't have dust going from top to bottom. This is glued into the side. You don't have to worry about it because the, the, uh, this frame in its length is not going to move. And of course the plywood's the same. So it makes for a nice strong joint, easy application. And the advantage of the frame is, although it takes more time than it's using a solid frame, it, uh, it's much lighter. So easier to move around if you have to move it. Here's another uh, wooden frame. We're gonna talk a little more about this because applying a frame like this into a solid wood cabinet, you've got expansion happening on the side you don't have expansion happening on the frame. You have to take that into account. Same thing on this one. Solid wood side, a frame that's stable. You have to deal with that. Um, this is another example of the easy way of doing it. Solid wood side, solid wood frame, uh, 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 divider. Even though this is poplar, the two woods are gonna move at a close enough rate that you don't really have to worry about it. So whatever means of fastening this to this, you don't have to worry about expansion. Like I said, it's faster, but it's also heavier and it uses up more material. And the last one is another example of a frame with a dust panel sitting in a side that is made out of um, MDF. So it's stable. This is, this, is, this is not going to move. So the two can be fastened permanently, not an issue. Okay, now let's get, uh, let's talk very specific about how we actually do this in terms of fastening those sides, in, uh, the uh, dividers into the sides. All right, let's talk about putting MDF divider into an MDF side. So we use what's called a dado. Here's an example. It is a uh, trench or a housing or a groove, whatever you want to call it, that runs across the grain. You don't want to go too deep because you'll weaken the outside, uh, the actual piece itself. 
but you want to go deep enough that you it provides uh, enough contact so that your glue joint is going to be strong enough for the application. So usually I miss anywhere between 3 16 and quarter of an inch. The advantage of a quarter of an inch, it makes much easier math. So we've cut this a quarter of an inch deep. Now this is called a stop dado. You don't want that running all the way through. It doesn't exactly fit when you're talking about fine furniture. So we've stopped it about a quarter of an inch away from the front. Now what's happened here is this piece of MDF has had this piece of solid ash glued to it. There's nothing reinforcing the joint. I've tested this and gluing that solid piece of wood onto the edge of that piece of MDF is plenty strong. You don't need to add a spline or anything like that. It's not going to come apart without wood failure. And if the weakness of your glue joint is wood failure, you can't do anything better than that. So what we do when we apply this, uh, create this joint, is we do what's called a stop, as I mentioned, we call it a stop dado, but then we have some kind of a shoulder on the tenon. Now, I didn't do it here, and I'll talk more about when we talk about the wood frames, but um, you'll notice that I put a shoulder on this. So if you can ignore that for a second, this one would look like this. However, in order to have a nice neat joint here, which is what we've done, we've cut back the front so that when that goes together, and it covers that, you've got a nice clean fit all the way around and this is nice and neat. Now, you'll notice that this is flush. Don't recommend doing that. It's awkward, it's difficult. When it comes time to actually planing everything flush, you've got a whole bunch of these pieces that are having to, that when you plane, you're crossing over this piece, or as you plane this piece, you're crossing over these, and it just makes for a lot of extra work. I'm gonna, so that's how we do an MDF, or a plywood on plywood dado for your horizontal divider. And uh, as I mentioned, I don't recommend keeping it flush. I much prefer to do something like this, where you actually hold the joint back. Hold it back enough so that it looks intentional. If you're too close, it looks like a miss. If it's purposely hepped back, not only does it give it a little more um, depth because of the, the various dimensions, but it's much easier to do, much cleaner, and can, far better way of doing it. So this is the example where we're using a light frame made out of four pieces of wood, relatively narrow, with a dust panel in between. Uh, it's probably a, a third, or maybe even a quarter of the weight of this piece of MDF divider. So although it takes extra time to make, if you're having to ship this around, or even if you're wanting to make it so it's a little easier to move around, this would be a better choice. Uh, because this frame is designed to be stable, in both its length and its depth, you don't have to worry about fastening it into a piece of material that is stable. This is plywood, so it's not going to move. Again, a dado has been cut, probably a quarter of an inch deep, and this piece of poplar is glued into that dado all the way. There's no problem with expansion. I didn't bother trying to hide this joint because as I mentioned, this is all hidden from the drawer front itself. Um, the dust panel, you always want to include something like this. It just is going to keep the contents cleaner. It doesn't allow the dust to f top, fall from the bottom to the top. It also gives you a nice enclosed compartment so that when you close your drawer, you feel that cushion of air, which is always a kick. Um, the other example of this, which is a little fancier, is over here. So on this chest of drawers, these dividers were intended to be seen on the front. Again, held back so that you have that, it's just a visual interest. Instead of having it all in the same plane, this one is stepped back. I put a little radius on here so that when the drawer, which also has a matching radius, when it closes together, if they're not exactly flush, it doesn't matter, this is well hidden. Uh, this also has a dust panel, same idea. This is a mortise and tenon construction, both in front and back. And the nice thing about it is it provides a nice surface for the drawers to run on. These are drawer stops, in case you're wondering, so that the drawer doesn't go all the way in or you don't have to rely on the back of the drawer in order to stop your drawer. It stops right here and it keeps it the same at the front all year round. One more point I wanna make on this. Some folks would go in and try to add something to strengthen this joint. Uh, you could use short dowels, you don't have a whole lot of room. You could use mortise and tenon. You could use a spline of some sort. I really don't think it's necessary 
you can test it yourself, glue something like this into a, a dado. If it fits properly and it's glued properly, it's going to be stronger than the wood itself. And that's the point where adding anything to it is really a waste of time. There's no, nothing being gained. I also wanted to mention this. I, I cut this little recess just so that you would have access to the little cutout on the bottom of the drawer, a little finger recess, which keeps it nice and clean. And by that, I mean, I don't like, I don't necessarily like drawer pulls. I find that uh, they don't age well. Whereas something like this, uh, you never have anything coming off. And uh, it just, I think it really makes the, surf the front of the drawer look uh, really clean. All right, let's talk about the one that's the more difficult, and that is when you're using solid wood for the carcass. Now, I don't remember when this was built, but I know it's been at least 25, 30 years. So the sides are made out of solid walnut, sides and top, and the bottom. Uh, this example, solid poplar, top and bottom, and this example, solid walnut again, top and bottom. Let's start over here with the easiest. The easiest is you make your, your divider out of solid wood. In this case, it's poplar because again, it's another example where the uh, divider is being hidden by the bottom of the drawer. Now, I've actually gone in and toenailed these and you can do that if you want. Um, I, didn't, I didn't believe that end grain gluing was as strong as it is, but we'll leave a link to a video we did. I was shocked at how strong it was. But as an extra, I uh, toenailed, so I drove small finished nails on an angle from here, so they would come down into about, obviously you gotta be careful they don't come through the surface, but that just adds a little bit of mechanical strength to the chemical strength of the glue joint itself. But this is fast and easy. Um, I put a shoulder on this all the way around, and we'll talk about that with an example we have up there, whereas the shoulder makes it a lot neater. Um, just because trying to get this to be the exact thickness all the way across uh, sometimes is more of a challenge than what it's worth. The shoulders are a much neater, quicker way of doing it. But this is, the, this is an example of the fastest and the easiest way to do your dividers. However, you can remember it's going to add a lot of weight because it's solid wood. Now, when we come over here and we use a frame, frame is nice and light. However, the problem is these sides and uh, this piece is 16 inches wide. So I could expect, I could expect uh, as much as an eighth of an inch movement in this seasonally from the moist part of the year to the dry part of the year. This frame, which is wood in its length, both side to side and front to back, means it's not going to move at all. So you have to allow for that. Now you don't want it changing out here. This is an integral part of the overall look of the joint, or of the look of the piece. I've cut a little bead in here, and that little bead meets this little radius, and it just kind of breaks that joint and makes it a bit of a, a visual feature. So you can't have this changing. This has to stay in the same spot that it is right now with the front of the actual side. So you have to support this somehow into the here. And uh, I probably did a, probably used a dowel. You could use a mortise and tenon if you want. But all you're worrying about is just this walnut piece staying in the exact same spot. Everything back here is going to be doing the moving. If you look way back in, you can't see it, but I'll explain it to you. This is a mortise and tenon fit between this piece of poplar that the drawer rides on and this piece of walnut at the back. But that's a dry fit. That means that this piece of walnut is fastened to the side. It doesn't move. Probably has a dowel in there as well as being glued. This piece is dry fit into the groove or the dado on the side, um, and that's allowed to move. It, this will come in and out of the mortise in this walnut piece. So the tenon on here is relatively long, and it's free to pull out or move in, and you have to make sure that you allow for enough of that movement. But uh, because it's permanently fastened here, and that piece is permanently fastened back there, you shouldn't have a problem. Now, some may worry about the sides bowing. Well, we've got a really strong joint up here, and we've got a strong joint down at the bottom. That's the solid wood bottom. So chances of this bowing or cupping, I don't think are terribly uh, uh, worrisome. There is a way that we can, we can alter, or we can uh, prevent that, and I'm gonna show you that in another example. But for something this wide, I'm comfortable. If it was really tall, then you may want to incorporate something. 
and that something is this. What you see is a screw with two washers sitting in a larger diameter hole. So because there's a dry fit here between this piece and that piece, in order to keep these tight, which also helps prevent this piece from this side from bowing at all or cupping, that screw passes through a large hole in here, obviously fastened firmly to the outside, to the vertical piece. I use two washers because I find that the two washers, the steel on steel, is going to move without any resistance, unlike having a piece of steel sitting into a piece of wood where it may actually get stuck down in there. I just prefer to do it that way. So you can use as many of those as you feel necessary, as long as the hole in this piece is big enough to allow for that movement without it obstructing at all and uh, preventing that screw to stay tight to this, but the piece moves around it. Hey, if you like this video, we have more. Our monthly newsletter has subscriber-only content, discounts monthly on tools, and anything we bring out that's new, subscribers get first crack at it. Click on the link below. Let's get back to work. Let's talk a little bit about the actual assembly. Now, at this point, everything is square, properly milled. You're, you've verified that your dado is uniform depth front to back. You used your router plane for that. You've made sure that your frames are all the same size. That's critical. They're all square. That if you now, how do I make this so that everything comes out perfectly square? Well, the easiest way is to just break it down and do one piece at a time. I often use my bench as a means of clamping. So what I would do, none of this would be like such. We would have just the bottom piece sitting here. I would start with the first frame and I would clamp the frame like so using my bench as a big call. I'd have my square on here to make sure that it's square. And if you can't reach the back side, I've used, uh, I've put a long timber across the top like this and clamped it from that side and from this side so that you could apply pressure all the way across. Make sure everything is nice and square. Wait for the glue to set up. Move on to the next one. Do the exact same thing. And making sure that when you put your square in there that you cannot see any light top or bottom. Get it as good as you can possibly measure. Do all three of these. Remember the top's not on yet. At that point you're going to add the uh, second piece. And sometimes it's easier to flip it over so that you can clamp against this piece down onto that second one. You've got to line everything up. It's nice to have a second pair of hands at this point because there's always the problem of one piece not being perfectly aligned, meaning this gap is going to be a little bit different from one to the other. Um, you've, got to, you've got to be very careful with your glue. The minute you start to put glue on it, the wood starts to absorb that moisture and things start to swell. So I try to get it so that everything is really close. Now in an application like this, I would have the glue down inside the dado. That way it's not dripping off of this while you're trying to lower it down on. Get everything lined up, tap it in with a rubber mallet, as it comes tight, then check to make sure. Now in this case, these are gonna be flush on the back. That would be the easiest way to tell. So I would make sure that each one is flush. If I had to, rather than beat it with a mallet, I could put a block on here and I could use my clamp to pull this one way or the other. Meaning I would have that referenced on the case and I would have this on the actual frame and I could apply enough pressure to move that just a little bit or I could do it the other way to slide it in the other direction. When everything is perfectly lined up, bring it down tight with a mallet, then you're just gonna go in and apply your clamps, top to bottom, side to side, go in with your, to make sure that you're square on all of these. Now if you're not, what I find you can do is come in here and hit this with your mallet or a hammer or a block and a hammer and slide that over a little bit and that will do just what you need to move that ever so slightly. But if the distance between this dado and this dado is the same on all of them, then if one's square, all the rest are square. And if they're not, you made a mistake somewhere that could be very difficult to deal with. Last part of this we'll cover is the actual attaching of the top to the case. Um, I always try to do it so that this can be added last. All of this difficult work is done. You put the top down on and you're ready to build drawers. So I use a miter here. This is mitered, this is mitered, that's mitered, that's mitered, that's mitered. This is a butt joint. So I've got three different examples that we can show you. Uh, in this case, what I've done, and we're gonna do a video on this soon, 
I've gone in and I've cut splines. They're about 5 8 square by 5 16 of an inch in thickness. And I lined up little slots cut in each of these two pieces. There's probably one, two, three, four, five, six, maybe seven of them. And uh, I always put the little spline, I glue it into the one section first on both sides. And then you're not trying to deal with a loose little spline. It's already fastened in. And it's still a nightmare because there's so much glue surface. But if you get them all in the bottom first, make sure there's no dry glue anywhere that's going to prevent things from closing. Then you can tap it in and pull it tight. I'm going to I did that here. I did that here. I did that here. On this one, again, it's a miter. Now, this was, uh, this was uh, an experiment that ne didn't necessarily turn out so well as far as how it looks. Back from my nautical days of working on a tugboat, I used um, rope on the front and as the uh, handle for the drawer. But mahogany was the accent wood, so I used mahogany on the sides and let it come through the front. And then I used splines up here. I actually cut into the miter and, and, and laid a piece of mahogany, and then I did these splines. So in this case, you can just simply glue the joint together without any support. It'll hold until you then go in and make these cuts. Now this is done on the table saw with this upright. You've gotta have some kind of a sled to hold it at a 45 degree angle so that you can cross the table saw and make these nice neat cuts. And if you do this nice, you can actually get an effect that you'll like. Uh, on this one, I have used several dowels. So it's a solid wood top onto a solid wood side. And there's probably one, two, three, four, five, six, seven dowels. You don't have a whole lot of depth for your dowel on the top. That's why I made so many. Uh, down here, I could run the dowel in a long way. So there'd be lots of glue surface. Don't have that advantage up here. So I made up by using multiples, but that'll still be a, make for a strong joint. And last, hopefully this answers some questions for you when it comes to carcass construction. Just remember, sides must remain parallel, top and bottom must remain parallel, so that you can then fit a drawer to that opening and have it fit like a piston. And there's nothing more satisfying than casework like this. Good luck. If you enjoy my method of work, and like my style of teaching, click on any one of these videos to help take your woodworking to the next level. I've always said better tools make the job so much easier. If you click on the plane and chisel icon below, it'll take you to our site and introduce you to all the tools that we actually manufacture right here in our shop. It'll also give you information on our in-person and online workshops.